Hi, I'm Jerry. Hi, I'm Joe. Jerry and I have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles taking pictures and having the conversation about the state of being you have to be in to get a good picture. The first lesson is not to take all this too seriously. It should be fun. We only have two rules. You can stop whenever you want to take a picture and take as long as you want to get it. Today, on our first episode, we're going to leave the city and take a drive in the country. And our only real destination is the next picture. I was the first one to take advantage of the rules. I saw these trees, but mostly I saw the shadows on the golf course. They all came to a point, so I wanted to make the most of those points, so I just started playing with them to see how they would all come together. Then I noticed these, uh, what do you call them? Traffic cones. Traffic cones. And I put those in there, and, well, that made it. Well, it made it more. It made it more of a joke. It made it funnier. And to me, that's always the point. I'm in the car, but, of course, I'm not just going to sit there. This is a road trip. I start taking pictures. First, of Jerry taking pictures of trees and points, and some for my car series. I've taken hundreds of them. I shoot them when I'm driving and sometimes when I'm a passenger. Sometimes I use the frame of the window. I have a series of those. Sometimes I shoot without even looking in the camera. In this one, I saw a possibility. I jacked the car around to arrange the frame to make the most of the eyeballs, and then this guy walked by and made the nose. Nice touch. Having the two O's looking like the two eyes. That says photo, right? Is this a photo store? Yes, it is. Oh, that's fantastic. The last picture here I got when a friend was driving me in L.A. I actually shot it just for the yellow signs, and when I got home, I discovered that I had all white cars. Yet another great synchronicity. We drove a couple more miles. This time, I'm the one pulling over. Oh, horses. I'm so surprised. I grew up on a ranch in South Dakota, and I started riding when I was five years old. I just love horses. Don't I know it. I've been taking pictures of you, taking pictures of horses for decades. Remember that white horse in Arizona years ago? Oh, do I remember. We were driving. It was well over 100 degrees in the desert, and there was this big pasture in the middle of nowhere, and a horse all alone, and he was running and bucking. It was like he was begging us to stop. He wanted some company. We pulled over, and I headed out for the horse with my camera. It was so great. He ran up and down the fence line with me. He let me push his head around and take all these different shots. And finally, I got one of my all-time favorite pictures, the dream horse. It's like the Pegasus cloud in the sky is like his spirit, getting free from the enclosure. That's an amazing picture. It strikes me that every picture is a kind of co-creation. Back to our trip to Point Reyes. Here he comes, and I start shooting. Love the shadows and love the gesture. And I love the negative space around him. It really sets him off. But because everything is so perfect, the nose against the fence is really distracting. I'd get rid of that fence completely. You're right. Uh, sometimes when I'm taking pictures, I'm anticipating what I'm going to do in Photoshop later. Yeah, right. I'm sure you notice the nose against the fence. <laughs> it wasn't long before we saw a tree that really made us stop. Oh, and it has a horse. <laughs> yeah, nice scene. But I wish the black horse would move against the light area. And almost immediately, I got my wish. There, that's perfect. Now he's even darker because he's in the shadow which really makes him stand out against the background. That's good. I got the shot. But wait a minute. To my surprise and amazement, he just started bucking and going wild. I shot a few frames, and then I realized I had to bump up the shutter speed to freeze the motion. So I took it from a 60th of a second to a 250th of a second. I love the first shot. But this shot is so unusual to have something so wild in such a beautiful pastoral scene. After the dust settled, I got this shot. 
Good job. That's cool. I like that a lot. Nice feel. Yeah, you got all the action, and I got this whole different peaceful feeling. That's what's so great about shooting with other photographers. You get to see that there are an infinite number of ways to see the world. After all that horsing around, how could I not take this picture? Look at the size of that thumb in the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next, we stopped at the town of Point Reyes Station, and while we walked around, I stepped into a car repair joint. It was, it was like stepping back in time. It reminded me of a Walker Evans picture, which we had just seen at a huge retrospective of his work at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. Next, we were at Point Reyes National Seashore, at a spot where we always stop that's always so magical. But you know, uh, not today. It's really, uh, well, boring. It's amazing how weather, time of day, and time of year has such an effect. It is amazing. It's just startling. The place itself is startling, but the way things change is so dynamic. Once I was there with our friend Lori, I wanted to take a picture of her in this beautiful setting. But, like almost everyone, she was nervous about getting her picture taken. So I took a few pictures just to help her feel more comfortable. It didn't take long. She found the space and I pushed the shutter. Just like the landscape, people are different and have lots of different expressions and lots of different ways of being from day to day, even minute to minute. Then, just like all the local photographers, we had to stop at the famous Point Reyes Cypress Tree Tunnel. It's such a great scene and it always looks different. At Drake's Beach, Jerry stopped at the visitor center to shoot some of his famous shadow shots, and I headed to the beach. As usual, during the middle of the week, we were the only ones there except for the seagulls. There were no people, but there was plenty of stuff to play with. The shadows, the reflections, the dark birds against the sky, and the white ones against the sand. As many times as I've been here, it's always different and always amazing. Nice placement of the seagull, Joe. The light against the dark really makes it stand out. It's like the horse, but in reverse. I thought the breaking wave would be the shot, but it made the bird disappear. Without the dark, you can't see the light. Sometimes little things make a huge difference. Sometimes that light and dark thing can be very subtle. I remember being here when it was like walking around in a black and white photo. Other times... Like today, it's crisp as a bell. The landscape is so beautiful. It's so easy to get lost in the big picture. It's also valuable to look at what's right at your feet. Priceless. I don't know what it is, but we photographers really love abandoned buildings. Abandoned, but not worthless. There's just so much to look at. They've got character. Like in this one, the texture of the weathered wood and the windows, and both of them surrounded by the bold black of the shadows. And then, through the dirty window in the farmhouse, everything became really subtle. This is a good example of the painterly technique, where you put warm and cool colors together to create a sense of depth. I really love the pastels in this one. Well, I really love all the doors. And the mirrors are great, too. Then I backed off from that dirty window and made it, and the reflection, the subject of the photo. It reminded me of this picture which I shot with my first real camera. I was helping my dad on the ranch hang a hoist in the barn. He was raising me up on the front of the forklift and I saw this scene outside through the window. I yelled, put me down, and I ran in the house for my camera. He lifted me back up just in time to catch the sun on the tops of the trees in the distance. This is the first picture that made me feel that I could really be a photographer. Now, back at Point Reyes Ranch. This is the first shot I did in the barn. Looking at the display on the back of the camera, I remembered a principle that I learned along the way. That your eye goes to the brightest spot in the picture. See that open door on the right? and how it pulls your eye away from what's interesting in the picture. So, I reframed and took this one. Yeah, that's so much better. 
Even though I gave it a second look, I didn't turn around and see this shot Jerry did later. Again, that's what's so great about shooting with another photographer. You get to see things from another point of view. This picture was also informed by another barn that I was in that reminded me of the stained glass in a European cathedral. Walking across the barnyard, I noticed the odd shape of the roof. Because that part of the barn was in the shade, the shape of the barn was more dominant. And while I was there, I thought it'd be a great opportunity for a starburst, which is as simple as placing the sun exactly on the edge of a dark object. Yeah, you've never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let me be more expansive about this. First, if you want to make a silhouette, expose for the background, which will turn the subject in the foreground into a silhouette. Yeah, a silhouette is just a creatively underexposed picture. Now, to make a starburst, just put the sun on the black edge of the subject that is now a silhouette. But on the very edge, a little too much, and it will get completely blown out. To keep from getting blinded when you're setting up the picture, there's a simple trick. All you do is turn around, look down, and see your own shadow. And once you find it, put the shadow of your head right in the middle of the shadow of this object. Then turn around and see the light. It's like an eclipse. You put a moon in front of a star and wait for the sun to crack across the edge. This is a trick that you can use in lots of situations, whether you are creating a solar flare or simply adding a little something extra to your family photo. We're back in the van, ready to go, and while I was taking this picture of the bird in the buildings, Jerry saw the Thule elk in the distance. That was my cue. I grabbed the 300mm lens and began the hunt. I knew there were Thule elk out here, but I'd never seen them before. I approached as quietly as I could. As soon as I noticed them notice me, I took my first shot. I took a number of shots. I kind of liked this one. The shadow was great, but the image quality just wasn't there. But it was great to finally see them. I didn't get the picture that I'd been imagining for years, the one where they're on the horizon and the light is perfect. I let it go and walked back through the field. While you were gone, I discovered this cool gate. It reminded me of the gates my dad made on the ranch. I love how it stands out, both because of its color and the play of light and shadow. Beyond just the silhouette in this one, there's a story. What's going on with these wires? Who did that and why? Did they realize the artistic quality in the way they wrapped the wire? We're headed back home. Birds are coming in to roost, and the shadows are getting long, and the light is getting really good. It wasn't a mile later that we were surprised by these birds. No time to stop, so Jerry grabs the wheel, and I start shooting out the side window while we're still moving. It's something we've done for each other thousands of times. I told Joe to stop as the sun was about to set, just so I could get one more picture. Almost immediately, I saw a horse and the possibility of a good silhouette. Like we said before, to get a silhouette, just exposed for the background and let the rest get underexposed. The horse just looked like a big blob from straight on. I was hoping for a picture like this one that I shot 30 years ago. But it wasn't that. But it still had lots of possibilities. I waited until I could get a profile. I kept shooting as he got closer and kept making corrections, like getting the entire head above the horizon to let the negative space hold the shape of the whole horse. That looks like the optical illusion horse in your first book. Yes, it does. I've been using that picture for years in talks and articles to illustrate how the eye is blind to what the mind can't see. It's a horse, of course, but which way is the horse facing? Is his tail towards the camera and he's looking away? Is his tail towards the camera and he's looking back over his shoulder at the camera? Is his rump in the rear and he's looking forward? Or is his rump in the rear and his head is looking over his shoulder away from the camera? I find it interesting that people who are always around horses have no confusion about which one it is. So, which one is it? Oh, it's the one on the bottom left. I love optical illusions. 
they remind me about the malleability of reality. When I remember that I am making up my picture of the world from my own lines of thought, life itself becomes a creative act. To change the reality of this horse at Point Reyes, all I had to do was change the exposure. We were face to face. I was close enough to feel his breath, close enough to notice the whiskers on his chinny chin chin. That became the picture. Okay, time to go home. Wait, one more. Oh, look, a coyote. Yeah, but nothing like the picture you took in Death Valley. Oh, the one on the road? Yeah, that's a good one. But I was thinking about the one where you used the van as fill light. That was cool. And you can even see the van in his eyes when you zoom in. Oh, look, a bull. Oh, look, another bad picture. <laughs> the light's perfect for a great silhouette, but clearly this isn't it. It wasn't two minutes later that we saw the Thule elk on the hill. We did everything we knew not to scare them away. We drove slow and we coasted to a stop with the engine off. It was unbelievable. They were just being there, being perfect. It was so weird. It just kept being perfectly beautiful. So much so that you could start to study the subtleties of how they interacted with one another. Each moment, each picture was as good as the next. How many pictures did you take? More than 50. Yeah, me too. There even became a moment when I remembered to put the camera down and just be there. It was clear that they were there for the night, and it was time for us to call it a night ourselves. We still didn't stop. Literally. There's always one more picture. Goodbye for now. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you down the road on another trip. Where, as usual, the only destination is, is the, the next, next picture. picture.